Uh, as Dean said, my name is Mark Mangini, and I'm a sound designer. Uh, I'm a supervising sound editor. I'm a sound artist. That's a, a term I like to use a lot. Um, and I'm one of the many authors of the sound of this movie. It, I don't do this all myself. I'm sort of at the pinnacle of a large group of people that did some amazing work. Um, thank you for having me, and it's an honor to be able to sort of kick off this new event, this new room for Westlake. It's, they could have chosen just about anybody in any movie, but they chose um, Mad Max, and it's pretty thrilling to be the person to be able to present it. But we're here to talk about Mad Max. Um, there's a lot to talk about. I'm not going to be very technical in this discussion. I'm going to really make this kind of a behind-the-scenes presentation. I'm guessing that you're here that because you're kind of geeked out on Mad Max like me, and I'm hoping you want to see a little bit of what I experienced while making the movie. So you're going to see interviews and, and hear some of the players talk about the movie. So um, how many of you have seen, who, who here has seen Mad Max already? I just want to get a read on the room. Holy shit. Okay, so <laughs> I'm preaching to the converted or whatever, whatever that expression is. Uh, I'll try to keep the spoilers out so you can still enjoy it later. And I'll attempt to give you this sort of peek behind the scenes from home movies and photographs that I took while make, working on the film. I'll also share some uh, observations about sound and creativity. I'll try not to pontificate too much, but I, there, there's some sort of regular themes in my work that I want to continue to sort of preach. And uh, then after I'm done doing all of this, we'll do a Q&A, I think, for about 30 minutes. And I'm happy to answer any kind of questions that you have. Um, I don't have any secrets. I don't have any uh, mysterious plug-in cocktails. Um, or, and I don't have any sounds uh, that I want to hide from you. Um, I mean, I have all of that stuff, but I've never seen the value in guarding any of that information. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So, what is this immersive sound thing? Obviously, this, this room is all about immersive sound. You are surrounded with speakers. Um, and it, it may just simply be that. It's an array of speakers that allows the sound artist to surround the audience with sound. Well. Surely, that's the physical aspect of sound immersion. But I don't think that's its highest use. As I see it, there's two relevant ways to be immersed. One is physically, with speakers. The other is emotionally. To be physically immersed means that we are engaged by our ears as we are surrounded by sound. While this is a valuable filmmaking tool, I think it is in emotional immersion using sound to tell stories where sound design has its greatest hold and does the heavy lifting. I'm, I'm not downplaying the importance of having these tools to render immersive sound, but I want to talk more about how do we get to these speakers? What, what's that idea of how do you immerse the audience in your ideas? How do you immerse your audience in a story? And it's, it's, it's being immersed in emotion that I think grips audiences and aids in storytelling. It's all about using emotion. Emotion is the most direct way to engage and immerse an audience. Most of us don't understand emotions, and we certainly seem to ignore them in our work often. So my advice is learn the fine art and the difficult skill of recording and converting your impulses and emotional responses immediately and into concrete action. These are the techniques that I used on Mad Max, and I've been leveraging and um, practicing my entire career. These emotions, these feelings, these impulses are often fleeting and easy to ignore, but they are truthful and useful. We are not trained to do these things as we have bought into the irrational notion that what we do is technical. And when I say we, I mean all of us. I'm sure there's some sound designers, there's some record engineers in here, there's some Foley people, there's some voiceover people, there's some commercial people. All of us are sound artists. What we do is not technical. That's a falsehood. Do not buy into that. Back to emotion. Learn to monitor your emotional state. Consequently, ask yourself, how do I feel? And try to get out of the unproductive dialogue that is in your head that asks, what do I think? Once you understand how you feel about something, you have a concrete basis for direction on where your creative impulses will lead you. 
And that leads to positive action and creative action. The people that you work for have mastered these skills already. Directors, actors, producers, musicians. It's valuable to begin to learn how to speak in their language. Another piece of advice I'd like to give you <clears throat> is to develop skills that have nothing to do with what you do or what you think you do. I've benefited most from taking acting classes, improv comedy classes, writing classes, cinematography classes, all disciplines seemingly unallied, having no relationship to what I do for a living, which is sound design for motion pictures. But actually, these skills are essential to being able to communicate what you want to achieve in sound with your filmmakers. And they all have a unifying core philosophy, always be in service of the story. I can say unequivocally that it has been my storytelling skills, my improvisational skills, being able to respond in the moment when I'm challenged by a filmmaker, and my ability to connect with how I feel that have got me satisfying work far more than my ability to deliver a high fidelity soundtrack or an immersive soundtrack. So, Mad Max. I got the call on a Friday night and I was in Sydney the following Monday. No one quite knew why the film didn't sound right, but they knew they didn't. it didn't and they needed help. It was a good film, <clears throat> that much we all knew, but the film didn't live up to its potential. Could I put energy and vitality back into a soundtrack? Could I put the director's vision back on the screen? And could I do it in four weeks? <laughs> As you will see, that was a severe underestimation of what it would take to complete the movie. Thus began my seven-month odyssey of redesigning Mad Max Fury Road. The story of why Mad Max Fury Road didn't sound great before my arrival is not made clearer by explaining the technicalities of what went wrong, though a lot had. It just didn't fulfill George Miller's vision of the film. It lacked focus, if nothing else. George Miller had described in great detail to his crew how to achieve this focus using his top of the pyramid scheme. But this is one of the first things I saw when I arrived in Sydney. This was outside the dubbing stage, and it puts into detail George's philosophy about how to create sonic focus in a mix. It gives you an idea of what do we want to pay attention to. This describes a methodology of determining what at any given moment in the film is the narrative concept and focusing on what one sound best tells that story. That's top of the pyramid, and that's there you can see George Miller, top of the pyramid. It's how to create focus and clarity in a mix. This is not a unique concept to film mixing. But unless the sound design has followed this from a content standpoint, success is mitigated and greatness cannot be achieved. Yet, everything was there. In fact, an overabundance of choice was available. So much so that finding a point of view for any given scene made the final mix an ag agonizing exercise of sound design by process of elimination. We had too much stuff. This is not fertile ground for excellence or originality. The first pass at the final mix of the film was often characterized by a time-enforced abandonment of a given sequence while uttering, that's the best we can do. Something had to change. The story of why Fury Road didn't sound great before my arrival is made clearer by understanding that no one seemed to want to speak or utter the unutterable to George Miller. Abandon this effort and start from scratch. I dreaded having to bear this news, but began going through the traditional motions of working on the sound for the film. As is common practice, I had spotting sessions with George Miller. We ran the film on the Avid as one does in traditional fashion, but what was untraditional about George was the way he talked about his film. Rather than get granular about the sounds that he did want, he'd talk about what the scenes were saying. He'd talk about what the drama meant to imply. He'd talk about subtext. He'd use all that squishy, ephemeral language that you hear in things like acting classes and writing seminars. And then he would say, Mark, 
how does sound support that? How does sound support what I'm trying to do dramatically on the screen? That left us wide latitude to create an experiment in ways that we don't normally have. I would have daily contact with George in a variety of forms after the spotting sessions. George, uh, among other things, would send me video notes regularly from the cutting room like this one. So I'm going to show you this. It's not particularly compelling, but I thought if you're a geek about Mad Max like I am, at least you'll get to see George in his element. And this is, I, I saw, when I arrived in Sydney, they handed me a four terabyte brick that had all of George's year and a half's worth of video notes to the team. And I was supposed to catch up on 25 hours of video notes to get up to speed on the movie. So here's George in the cutting room giving us some notes. For the R rating, we um, are adding kind of sweeteners uh, for, uh, with visual effects. Uh, but we're not, it's not just constant spurting blood. There's specific sounds which we need to hear, uh, which, which will help us see really what is going to be so brief and impressionistic. The sound will help us see it. And for instance, here's one moment where, where this... So you get the idea. There's, there's George at the screen and sort of uh, dictating to us um, what he wanted for that scene. Um, here he's talking about how we're going to deal with, in fact, the R rating that he fought the studio for for some time. The studio wanted a PG with the hopes that it would introduce the film to a wider audience. George wanted to protect the integrity of his film. The studio actually cut a PG-13 version and previewed it and got lower scores uh, than we did with the R-rated version. So the PG version was abandoned. Once uh, we had all sort of signed off on that idea that this was going to be an R-rated movie, George opted to sort of amp up what little graphic violence we have. I mean, I don't think, I know there's a lot of action, but I don't think this is a particularly violent movie. Um, but there is a little bit of sort of blood and, and that kind of stuff. And once we got the sign off on the R rating, um, he, we actually started adding in blood spurts on gunshots and things like that. And that's what that note was about, in fact, was the sounds that I would make for blood spurts. One of the other ways George would communicate with me was by voice memo, like this one. Hi, Matt. Hi, Mark. Uh, just um, having uh, reviewed and finished off the crowds in Spool 7, as we have done in Spool 1. Spool uh, means with, real. With in case Peter you're... Miller. Um, there is a moment that you, in fact, mentioned, Mark, which is, uh, you know, that, that, you know, why it's so easy to take over the Citadel. And I, I realise probably now that we've got the crowd saying, let them up, let them up, there is a moment where we can take a little bit more time for that line of the so-called brake man or the winchman way up on top to... You get the idea. Um, I loved these voice memos that I got from George because I do this all the time. Um, it's sort of a, a part of an obsession I have with never losing a good idea by documenting it the minute I have it. Uh, George did this regularly I have a collection of 248 of those voice memos from George on a wide-ranging uh, set of topics. Um, he would do the generally, he's, this is a very complex film and his day was crammed with um, DI, visual effects, sound, ADR, scoring, and these notes were usually generated in his car on the drive home at midnight. It was the only time he had a minute to sort of let down and, and let the brain flow freely, and then he'd dictate into his iPhone, and then he'd, he'd just email them to me. I can't stress enough the importance of this idea of documenting your ideas. You must capture your creativity the moment you have it, because these um, ideas are often fleeting. And I can tell you from experience, they don't come back. Whenever I don't capture an idea that just flash through my brain, if I don't write it down, record it, do something an hour later. I don't remember what, it, what, what the idea was. Create a space in your environment where the immediate documentation of these creative impulses is encouraged quickly and easily and, and, and get them recorded. I like George to do it with my voice memo app for ideas which always come in the car 
at 8.27 in the morning, exactly 25 minutes after caffeine injection, and getting in the car to head to the studio. And uh, there, there's, there's real solid biochemical sort of evidence of, of the effects of caffeine on the brain and creativity. I can tell you that that 25 minutes, because I live in Sherman Oaks, puts me at around the intersection of Lancashire and Moore Park, right in front of the St. Charles Church. Uh, this is where most of my epiphanies occur, so of course that's only fitting that I should have an epiphany in front of a church. Um, here's one of George's voice memos from second to last day of the mix. So earlier, Furiosa says, across the salt. We're never going to have a better chance to make it across the salt. And Max says, nothing but sand. It would be good to try to replace his word, sand, with salt. I wonder if any of us can do the line and see whether we can get away with it. Well, <laughs> um, that's a, that's the, I, I love that technique of, of a great director. He gives you an impossible challenge and sort of says, good luck, <laughs> you know. Um, George sent this at the very end of the mix, second to last day, and we didn't have time to cast a, cast a voice, voice alike. Well, um, <clears throat> I wanted to impress him, so I did it myself. Uh, my voice can get actually pretty gravelly in the morning before I've had my coffee, so I captured it uh, with my iPhone, and that's just a little dumb Easter egg for my family, if nothing else, that you'll hear me as Mad Max. <laughs> There's nothing but salt. Um, in the next slide, uh, we're in Sydney playing back spool one of the film for George after mixing all night. Again, this is not a very compelling video, but I wanted some of the geeks in the crowd to just to see kind of what our dubbing stage looked like and just get a sense of the sort of vibe in the room. So um, here's just a little piece of watching real one with George. The lights were dying. You see George there. And there's Chris Jenkins' dialogue and music mixer. Greg Rudloff affects fully atmospheres mixer. Me up here at Praetorial Station. Terrorizing itself. You get the idea. It's a mix. It's pretty tedious. It's like watching grass grow. Each of us in our own way. Well, I mean, I, I mean, you watching somebody else's mix is like watching grass grow. And, uh, and sometimes it can be when you're in the mix, it can be like watching grass grow, but uh, it wasn't like that for us. Um, this mix was not, you, uh, maybe you can tell by that, but there's not a lot of energy in that room. This, th this mix was not going well. George was testy and not getting what he wanted. The sound team began to really bond around this obsession with making a great soundtrack. I found surprisingly an uncommon ally in Tom Holkenborg, also known as Junkie XL, um, the composer of the film, uh, who has since become a fast friend. He and I were determined to break the mold and really make this collaborative effort where music and sound worked well together, but in a way that we designed collaboratively. To accomplish this, we would meet every morning for coffee. Here's, here's that biochemical thing again. We would meet every morning, we'd get picked up at the hotel, and we'd designate a different coffee shop every morning and I'll order two lattes, and then the conversation would begin. Um, and we'd talk about the movie. There was none of the usual territorial nonsense that accompanies legendary battles between music and sound effects. There was simply a dialogue about what the film was trying to achieve narratively and how we both could get to it with the tools that we had at our disposal. I think my musical background, I'm a guitarist, uh, engendered some form of trust with Tom. I certainly spoke his language. Um, Junkie and I were in fact embedded at the mix stage at Deluxe Stage One. Um, our rooms were just behind the mix room that you just saw, giving us immediate access to an ongoing mix we were attempting to improve. While I was in one room designing sounds, I could hear Junkie down the hall composing and writing the score and building it as we were doing it together. It was a fantastic and immediate. Um, also note that red hoodie. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, look at it carefully. <laughs> um, 
Here's a, a magical moment that I caught as I walked down the hall to ask Junkie a question about something I was working on, and I caught him in the middle of his process. He didn't even know I was at the door, but I just wanted to watch him do this. That's a Les Paul, if you can't tell. And he goes, ad, ad nauseum. So you sort of get that idea. There's an interesting footnote about Mad Max that when George presented the first draft of the script, this is wildly different than the first draft in 2001 or 2002. It was a, it was a story of Max, not Furiosa. And it was Max's adventure through the desert and the badlands or the wastelands. And he was accompanied by the Doof Warrior, like his minstrel. Like the minstrel was commenting with music, with the distorted guitar music, as Max um, experienced um, the, the story. So we got to have a lot of fun and we fooled around. Um, we, we'd try to break up the anxiety of working all night and the creative uh, pressures with silly activities. Junkie was an inveterate practical joker, so um, to have a little fun, I thought I'd have one on him. Again, um, notice the red hoodie. This was what he wore every day to the mix for eight months. Um, note the scantily clad woman. Um, it drove his wife crazy. So I had an idea to d diffuse it and give the crew a little bit of a laugh. Um, so uh, I had 45 red hoodies made for the entire. This is a very small portion of the crew, but there's Tom in the middle. Um, it, we gave one to George as well. We have a precious picture of George in it, but he won't let me show it. Um, and we surprised Junkie all wearing these at the front door when he came in. And in case you can't see what's on our hoodie, so here's a cute girl kind of topless, so I put this on our hoodies. Uh, <laughs> he hates this picture. <laughs> he refused. I think that was the only time he wore it was that one, that one morning. But the fun would sadly often lead to the realities of trying to turn around a mix that wasn't going well and how I could get it back on track. I knew I could make the film sound better and I knew the film needed it. I just had to tell George Miller with candor. I thought the film needed a rethink and the consequences that came along with it. Telling the studio the film wouldn't be finished on schedule, um, needing 12 more weeks of mixing and sound editorial, and a sum with a lot of zeros at the end of it to accomplish all of that. I had many sleepless nights in that first week where I imagined how my firing would look and feel. <laughs> but I summoned all my courage and I made this pitch to George and it was received warmly and with encouragement, I might add. And we proceeded my, with my plan to relocate the film to Los Angeles and redo the sound of the movie. This meant giving every sound meaning and intention and using sound to tell the story beat by beat, top of the pyramid. Making the vehicles, especially the war rig, the massive truck that Furiosa drives, recurring characters in the drama, which they were. The war rig probably had more screen time than Max did. They each needed a personality. They needed to do more than accelerate or slow down, travel from right to left, and be threatening at one moment or a haven for safety at another. Over the course of the next few months in LA, we became a tight-knit unit of filmmakers that worked as a collective. Here you can see George Miller on the left, as well as Chris Jenkins, Greg Rudoloff, David White, my co-nominee for sound and co-sound designer, and myself. It was a very rare and invigorating environment where we made all our decisions together, huddled as a team around a mixing console. Here's a shot of Greg Rudloff at the console in Warner Brothers Stage 10 during the last days of our third final mix. And we had three final mixes uh, totaling 75 days. That does not count pre-mixing, dialogue, sound effects, Foley, atmospheres, ADR, group wall, or crowds. I haven't done the total on all of that. I'm sure it's on the order of 150 days of mixing over the course of two and a half years. Um, we had some fun one day when George sent me a voice memo, I don't remember the number, describing a sound he wanted vocally. George was not usually at a loss for words, so this seemed fun and uncharacteristic of him. So I copied his vocal sound effect 
and put it in the mix. Here's that moment when I put it up on the desk for Greg uh, Rudloff, the sound effects mixer. <laughs> That's George making that silly <laughs> sound. We all had a good laugh, and then we took it out of the movie. <laughs> um, Notice George's uh, leather jacket. You, if you ever see him, you'll always see him in this jacket. And this will be the last wardrobe reference of the afternoon. Um, he wore this every day of the mix. When I asked him about it, he had a very logical response. With so many decisions as a director to make every minute, what to, what to wear was one more I didn't want to have to deal with. We sound designers have convinced ourselves of the importance of sound and its value to a film. George Lucas famously said, sound is 50% of the movie going experience. But does anyone really believe that? Is that just like a, a fairy tale our parents tell us to make us feel good at the end of the day? Do uh, filmmakers give this idea lip service to make us feel good? I'm happy to report that Fury Road has given us concrete proof. Upon returning from Sydney with the original final mix, mix number one, we previewed the film before a, an audience in Burbank, got a decent score, but nothing great. George signed off on my ideas about rethinking all the sound for the film. Six weeks later, we previewed the same film. No edits, no new VFX, no new score, no new dialogue. In short, nothing materially changed except for the new reimagined sound. It scored eight points higher. Now, I don't know how many of you are into statistics. That's a huge quantifiable number for a studio. I mean, every point has ramifications for millions of dollars in box office. And so I have to say it one more time. Sound only caused this film to score eight points higher. Remember that. It makes a difference. George would later tell us as we completed the film, as we got to the very end of the final mix, Mad Max is a film where we see with our ears. I had no idea the enormous extent to which sound could help me tell the story. I have never experienced such a potent effect by the well-orchestrated use of sound. You know, movies are break, broken down into reels. Mad Max had seven 20-minute reels. And at the end of every reel, the lights would come up. And before he gave his notes, he would, every one of us, he'd stop and he'd shake our hands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You'd thank every single person in the mix room, look you in the eye, which I didn't just do. And he said this to me on the final day of the mix, prophetic words, and words I'm going to echo for, for a long time. Sound artists are storytellers. I like this idea that we are sound artists. Often we are given a silent film, as we were on Mad Max. There was almost no usable production track. I mean, all that, as you, you've probably read the stories about what it took to sort of mount this production in the desert. Those are real cars and trucks that had real motors in them. There's no green screen and that's, they're really crashing and they're really blowing up and all that stuff's really real. Needless to say, the sound that you would capture for an event like that isn't very usable. You could never hear the dialogue. The movie is almost post-synced for dialogue. It's probably 95% post-synced, maybe 5%, a couple of interiors are uh, production sound. Um, although I will say Ben Osmo, the gentleman who um, recorded this, did some extraordinary things that I'd love you to ask me about later if, you, if you're interested in that stuff, on how we figured out how to mic things and capture what we did get, uh, really one-of-a-kind kind of things. As artists, it's our job to tell stories with sound. And much like the composer of the film score, the sound artist or sound designer, can influence how an audience feels about a movie with sound in ways that I think are much more sophisticated and equally as powerful. When I was a child, I was fascinated by artists and the mystique that surrounds them. Artists were, were portrayed by my grade school teachers as special creatures possessing otherworldly qualities that um, were always spoken of in reverential tones. This was a mystery to me, and it felt well beyond my reach as a mere mortal. In fact, the idea of artistic creativity and the freedom that it brought was frightening to me. I've spent a life trying to figure it out, chasing its meaning and informing my own work with it in some way. I think I've found a few truths along the way. One certainly is always be original and true to yourself. The other is never imitate. 
There are two really important videos I encourage you to watch to help you on your journey to artistic expression and creative freedom. These are the URLs and maybe you can screen capture them or something. The first is John Cleese of Monty Python fame talking about creativity and how to create the right environment to encourage your creativity. The second is a great uh, video documentary on Brian Eno, the famous musician and producer. Uh, in this documentary, Brian talks a great deal about his creative process, which is quite unique, as you will discover, and maybe not surprising to those of you who are musicians and probably read about him, and uh, has a lot to say, and it will certainly inform your view and your approach to creativity and your work. While you may not like Brian Eno's music, you cannot argue that what he does is always fresh and original, and I want to emphasize those two words and the beauty of them, fresh and original. There is a great myth circulated by popular media, uh, that of the overnight success. Uh, they are, in fact, about as common as unicorns. One of the best pieces of advice that I can give, and it isn't very original, but always needs reinforcing is practice, practice, practice. Constantly work at your craft. At first, you will fail miserably. That's good. You'll have to do it again and again and again and again. This sounds like crazy advice, but I recommend you fail early and you fail often. The sooner you fail, the sooner you get to success. It's a fact of life. Be thankful for your failures and learn from them. They are propelling you towards success. You just don't know it at the time. Uh, for the, the, the greatest primer I know on this idea of failure and how to get to success, get Don Hahn's book, Brainstorm. Um, the best primer I know on how to tease the artist out of you and how to nourish it. Learn to have ideas, develop the muscle, and flex it <clears throat> regularly. It is ideas that your clients, your filmmakers, your collaborators will respond to most, and secondarily, your technique. And in the words of Hans Zimmer, and I like this a lot, ideas are not limited by budget. The creative process takes place in your head. And so um, our little band of sound geeks from Sydney and LA, uh, Chris Jenkins, Greg Rudloff, Ben Osmo, David White, and myself would go on to win some Oscars for our work, um, receiving the Academy Awards for Best Sound Editing and Best Sound Mixing. Um, I'm not telling you this to cover myself in glory, but to show you something you didn't see or didn't hear if you watched the telecast. Uh, the video I'm going to show you is taken by my wife, who is sitting in the wings at the Dolby Theater, that what they do is when you're a nominee, they bring everybody down really close so you have a very short trip up to the stage so you can maximize your speech time. Uh, this is the video she took as I went to the stage to receive my award. I was not planning to say anything on my way up to the stage, but I was overcome with emotion, as you can imagine. This is a big event in somebody's life. Um, remember what I said about emotion. Um, you didn't get to hear what I said because the network um, muted me. Um, the irony of the sound guy being muted is not lost on me. Um, here's that clip. Fucking Mad Maxes! Let's hear it! Um, dropping... <laughs> I know, I know, it's, I'm sorry, Matt. I'm sorry, Rio. Um, dropping the F-bomb in front of one billion people is not a highlight of my career. By any means. But I am proud for being in the moment, just like my acting teacher told me to do. And finally, I can't think of a better way to close this discussion than with this clip. Oh, what a day. What a lovely day. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>